What can you do to help Ukraine? What can we do to help Ukrainians? Stay tuned. Hi, all. I'm Dan Smigrod, founder of the We Get Around Network Forum. Today is Thursday, September 8th, 2022, and you're watching a special edition of WGAN-TV Live at 5. Our topic today, Ukrainian Congress Committee of America, Georgia Branch Initiatives to Help Ukraine. And my guest today is Ukrainian Congress Committee of America, Georgia Branch, board member and president, Natalia Anaskviv. Natalia, thanks for being a guest on my show today. Well, thank you for the invitation, Dan. It's my honor. And help me with your last name, because I, I know I missed it. <laughs> On this cue. You okay. did perfect. <laughs> On this cue. Okay. Th th thank you, Natalia. Uh, Natalia, before we jump into the topic of today's show, I thought I would at least first ask you about your family, perhaps where they are in Ukraine and how they're doing. Sure. Uh, thank you for asking, since this is the question that, um, you know, on our mind all the time, we think about our family all the time. Um, luckily, my family is uh, in Western Ukraine, which is in safer area, um, which is, uh, if, to explain, Western Ukraine is the European part, the, the part that is close to Europe, close to the Poland uh, border. Uh, all my relatives, parents, uh, sister, cousins, grandmother, um, nephew, nieces, everyone there in Western Ukraine, as I mentioned, relatively safe, um, however, um, physically safe, not mentally. Yes, I am, uh, they are in Ternopil. Uh, they're in uh, Ternopil, which is, if things were normal times, it would be a drive to the west towards Poland of about? I would say, uh, because my mother is originally, and this is where my grandmother is, and part of my family uh, is in next to the border with Poland, uh, Volodymyr Volensky. Um, so that's, I would say, from Ternopil. And you know, it's hard to say you know, because Ukrainian drive is different from American. We don't have highways. It's usually train or you know, bus or car with the speed of 60 miles per, per hour. <laughs> so I would say probably eight hours of drive. Okay. And uh, I, I, I did hear that they're physically safe. M mentally, so how, does, how do they cope with what's going on today? Um, you know, there were some kind of stages of accepting the reality till they accepted the reality. Uh, in the beginning, it was a big of rejection reality uh, that I would call panic. And then um, with this, uh, with, through the time, seven months, they accepted the reality. And um, what can I say? My, my, nie my nephew he always, he's scared. So children probably more damaged because they uh, mentally, because it's hard for them to explain something. Um, and of course, uh, everyone wants them to be safe and cautious. So uh, the level of fear to the sirens is extremely big. And um, I just talked to my parents today. It's school, school has started. So my, my nephew, he is uh, seven, eight, seven years old. He's scared to stay alone because he's, he's, he's scared of, I mean, of course you can't leave him alone, but he can't be even in the room alone. He's scared of Cyrene. Um, my parents, they are in the village. They left the city and how they cope, they harvest. They plant the, you know, they plant their, uh, their vegetables. Right now it's a harvest time. They distract themselves. They try to do uh, what they usually do and they keep themselves busy because, um, and I know it's probably a little bit weird to say that someone leave their life on one part of the country when another part of the country is destroyed and people suffer and get killed. This is something that uh, being outside of that reality is harder for me to accept rather than for people that are in this situation. They leave their life, they leave their routine. Um, when, when you look at this situation and East and West are two different worlds, that's tougher for me, for example. Uh, my grandmother, 
when everything just started, she stopped to talk. She stopped talking, so she could like she became numb. She couldn't. She couldn't say a word. She was in such a stress. Um, and for older people, maybe it's harder because she's been through so much in her life that being in her in her late eighties, it's hard to believe that something like this would happen in a civilized world when she just wants to live her life and enjoy her grandchildren. Uh, she literally was, she had shock, like, like this, you know, like a shock stage when she couldn't talk for a while. And my um, aunt, her, her daughter, she, uh, she helped us to communicate with her because my grandmother, she wrote on the piece of paper, gave it to my aunt, and she would tell us what my grandmother said. She couldn't, she, she lost her speech for some time. Now she talks, she all, I mean, all good again. She's, she's recovering, but uh, mentally everyone um, going through this very, very differently. And have any of your family members left Ukraine? Uh, yes, my, uh, my cousins, some of my cousins, female cousins left Ukraine with children. Uh, at this point, I'm not sure if they're back. I don't believe they're back. Uh, most of my family, are in Ukraine. I would say probably 90%, everyone is there. Uh, first of all, it's easier for me to say because they are in Western Ukraine. Uh, second of all, um, however, you know, with this U for You program, there are multiple ways to leave Ukraine. And when I offered my parents to come at least visit me, they, they, they refused. So it's like something that people don't want to leave their homes, even if they have this opportunity, because it feels like for them, it's almost like reject their faith in God. Like it's their home who no one has right to tell them to leave that home. So it's something on, I, that's my personal observation based on what I heard from my very close family and friends. This is for them, it's like more, almost like on a religion level. They, they wouldn't leave the home. And even though my, uh, 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 one of my best friend's mother actually spent a very long time in Kharkiv on eastern part of Ukraine, the city hero right now, basically that is fighting for its freedom at this very second, right? Um, she was, she spent the, her long, when everything just started, she was in the underground. She wouldn't leave Kharkiv because she said to my girlfriend, she said, I will leave only when the university I work for and my house will collapse. It's very much personal to, for people to leave their homes, at least for people I know, my closest friends. And, and, and this is the city on the edge of Russia that Ukraine uh, soldiers are just today uh, announced are uh, taking back from Russia. Correct, correct. And, and she's not leaving. She actually already left. Uh, that was uh, that situation happened in the beginning, uh, maybe during the first two or three months. Then my friend actually insisted for her to leave, um, and she is in Poland right now. However. She's coming back to Ukraine, to Ternopil region, to Zbarash, uh, because, and I was, and I actually, um, of course, I, I was glad to hear that because it's my motherland and I offered help in anything she would need because her university from uh, Kharkiv relocating to safer area of Ukraine, so teachers will teach online. And she is moving back to Ukraine soon uh, to Ternopil, to Western Ukraine. Um, so it means that life is going on, people go to work, people, education is um, coming back. Uh, so yes, she's coming back to teach, to continue, to continue education work. And, and, and uh, you mentioned a phone call. Is it easy to make a call or email or? Uh, not, for, not for my friends that uh, had to communicate with people back then when uh, their relatives and friends were in the underground. No, no. It, I remember perfectly the first day of, of war when uh, two girlfriends of mine from Kharkiv 
myself, uh, we happened to spend that weekend together um, at the trip. And I remember very well every minute of that fear she had because she couldn't contact her mother. This um, was February yeah. 24th, 2022. Yeah. That right. was the weekend we left actually <clears throat> had tickets planned on the 24th, literally in the evening, we had a plane to Arizona. And that day was, and I'm probably jumping then, please stop me if I'm jumping in the wrong direction. That was the day when um, our organization nonprofit reacted so fast. And we just, we started this fundraiser and that, that day we decided that we'll go to visit our friend in Arizona, but that trip was 100% dedicated to the news, to the war issue uh, problems, to communicating with our relatives, um, supporting each other. Each of us don't have family here. And for us, we, we spent this weekend, that weekend together, we supported each other. That was the main thing we did for each other, especially for our friend that couldn't contact her mother because she was in the underground. And, uh, and, and we'll come back to that fundraiser. In terms of uh, 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 family members, are, are there any uh, male members of your family that are uh, now uh, participating as soldiers in? Not family, uh, because most of my uh, male members, of my relatives, they, uh, they have uh, families, they have children. And there is, uh, I am not going to tell you for sure how many children, but all of them have minimum three, two children. So um, because of that, they are not, they haven't been drafted. And of course, my father, I don't believe he's, he's in that age. Um, so not my, um, they are not, they, they are not, um, in the hot, in the, in, they're not at war. However, I have friends that are there. Um, luckily, thank God, everyone is still alive. People I know personally. Uh, uh, I'm glad to hear that. I can't even imagine how you go through every day. Is there a, literally a check-in process just so that you are able to check in with your family and friends to know that they are okay? Um, yes, you know, it's actually, they, they, those, uh, those people that are at the war zone, they use some special apps right now. They don't communicate through Facebook or not even WhatsApp. Um, they, they try to use this app Signal that's supposed to be the safest way of communicating. Uh, so that's the app that I could sometimes reach out to my friends. There are several of them, not that many. Um, and not, not immediately, I wouldn't get answer immediately. And that would be very short. Like, yes, I'm okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, something like this, but, um, but family since my family, but, but the rest of, of, of Ukraine is relatively, um, you know, back on, on a regular uh, way of life, I would say not like they, people try because war is happening. However, economic also has to keep going, you know, to like factories in the area. So they, they are online. Most of people are online if they're not in the underground. Hmm. So regular ways are okay, but are, are the, the ways we communicate. Okay. And, um, uh, when did you come to the U.S. and what, what what was the motivation? How did you end up in the United States and when? I just had my eighth anniversary on the 23rd of August. Uh, remember the day very well because, of course, it's right before it's a, it's a, our flags day. It's a, right before the um, before our Independence Day, and my sister has birthday on, on the Independence. I remember that it was 23rd of August. I stepped in it. I stepped on Atlanta's land. I was. I came here to marry a man that I met back in Kiev. Uh, since I moved to Kiev after graduation college in my 
city in from Ternopil. I moved to Kiev when I was 21 years old to build my career. And um, that's where I spent six years of my, of my life, of my adult life, conscious life, right? Like professional life. I uh, have, I am very much attached to Kiev, very much. And then um, that's where I met my ex-husband. <laughs> and then I met, uh, I came here in 2014. So basically in Kiev, I went through a revolution. I went through a revolution of, um, of February uh, when Yanukovych escaped Ukraine and our Maidan revolution of 2013, 2014. And I was participant of that revolution and my office, my work was right there on street in Stutska. I was right there. Um, I remember, I have very much, I still remember everything. Um, so probably that's why my, I have stronger feelings about everything not stronger it's not fair to say to other people i just have my personal other um feelings about certain things um so yes back then met my ex-husband back in kiev then moved here and that's basically destiny brought me here so uh let, let's uh, let's uh, fast forward eight years today uh it's thursday september 8th 2022 uh, let's jump into the Ukrainian Congress Committee of America. What is that? And then what is the Georgia branch? Of course. Um, so Ukrainian Congress Committee of America, Georgia branch, is a nonprofit, um, nonprofit organization that in Georgia was created to uh, promote uh, culture and traditions among Ukrainians, uh, immigrants, and Americans uh, with Ukrainian heritage. And for everyone else that would like to get familiar with our culture and traditions. That's what we have been doing for the past five years, um, the team I'm with. Now that's the Georgia branch, but the oh. Ukrainian Congress Committee of America goes- oh, Correct, back. correct, uh, my apologies. Right, so that is a, a nonpartisan, uh, Nonprofit that has been represented uh, interest of uh, um, Ukrainians in America since um, like 1940s. It's the oldest, the, lar the, the largest organization of uh, Ukrainians of, Ukra of, of Ukrainian diaspora in America. Um, that is the organization that was created many many years ago, and that's the that's the engine, I would say. Those are people that resolve those issues on a, polit on, um, on a political level. Uh, they consist of um, so many professionals that um, they, they, would, they would go directly to the government and write the letters and take part in political life of America, of Ukrainians in America. Um, they would negotiate with the government. And of course, again, our main goal for entire UCCA of America is to promote Ukrainian culture and unite Ukrainians in America. Um, however, based on the size uh, and uh, tools that each organization may have, they have the, the most tools to actually make the biggest difference in Ukrainian life in America. Now, uh, what I'm hearing is the word culture, this mission of culture, sharing culture, bringing culture together. How did that change on February 24th, 2022, in terms of the initiatives of the Georgia branch? Oh, uh, tremendously. Uh, right. We were, we were created to, to promote tradition culture through organizing fun events, through wearing our beautiful outfits, through laughing, dancing, uh, and suddenly we have to deal with war. We don't know what to do. And we had immediate response to create the fundraiser. And that was the start of, of this huge project that is still going on 
back then we have this uh, we have we uh, our IT volunteer and I have to tell, say her name because she's a lifesaver Anastasia Turner she created the website and that day she dropped everything and does and she created the page to collect money so we could get fundraiser and it started the first day we collected thirteen thousand dollars then and each 24 hours we collected so much money that it started to develop so life changed so our goal definitely shifted shifted completely so let, let me just go back for a sec so that's it the website is ukrainianatlanta.org, U-K-R-A-I-N-I-A-N, Atlanta, or dot, excuse me, atlanta.org. So that website set up the very first thing that you started to do was raise funds as uh, through the 501c3 nonprofit that the Georgia branch is. Correct. Correct. That's a very important uh, uh, detail that every that we have the legal right to do this. We we are five one c three organization and had tools. We had website where and which where people safely could just pay with their credit card. Um, and of course, life became chaos. And I cannot tell you how we we would we would be always on meetings deciding what to do, how to act, how to make it right. No one taught us what to do during the war, right? We just knew that we had to do something, but we didn't know what. And we adjusted our way of doing things multiple times as we as we went through the process. Uh, so it became chaos because people were calling us. Suddenly, um, Ukraine became the biggest interest of everyone. I'm not talking about reporters because that was reporters um, try, tried to reach out each of us to get any kind of information. And we didn't, we never had that exposure. We were so confused and lost, but in the same time, we had to put ourselves together and reply because we understood that's the responsibility that we did not choose. So suddenly we represented not the organization that three times a year get together uh, and um, celebrate biggest events. We represent organization, Ukrainian community. It's a different level of responsibility. When you have a phone call from government uh, people, from that everyone tries to get piece of information from us because what, what do we do first thing? We open yeah. our laptop, <clears throat> Google, and we come up, which is, and, and, and the level of interest, we had to come up of how to respond, what to say. So yes, in the beginning, it was a chaos a little bit. I, I'm gonna bring you back to that. But first, let's fast forward to today, seven months later, looking back at what the UCCA Georgia branch has accomplished. So could you take us through the highlights of what now has been accomplished in the, in the past seven months? That is an excellent question, Dan. Um, I am definitely, uh, without any doubt, I am proud of what we have accomplished. I am proud of what UCCA Georgia has become. It always has been a great organization with great values. However, the board of directors showed extremely high level of competency of professionalism, of talking to all this report, to all the reporters, to all the government, to the people, um, banks, companies, everyone they were trying to reach out. We showed professionalism. And that brought us to the level of being known. Because now we went, we went for meetings with, uh, with local government, with Democrats. They invited us, we went and we met. Um, office of John Ossoff, they reached out. We had online meeting. So all this, uh, so first bullet point, I would say it's the level of professionalism that, that each of us showed that, 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 that brings uh, organization to even higher level, to the level of professional organization. 
uh, also probably the main accomplishment is our fundraiser. We started the fundraiser with the help of uh, our tools. We raised more than $400,000, around $413,000 we raised as of today. All of the $400,000 were spent. And when I look through this, uh, through the, uh, through the spent, you know, this is what I'm proud the most. I'm going to ask you two questions from there. First, how is the money raised? Specifically, the kinds of activities, and then we'll talk about how the money was used. So, first, can you speak to examples of the kinds of UCCA Georgia branch activities that resulted in raising the money? Um, sure. I would say that most of the money uh, came through the negotiation, through, um, I would call them uh, not passive, but probably passive income when, when the website is still there and people just donate as they, as they uh, have opportunity. That's the first source of income. And another source of income are companies that we reach out or reach out to us, companies that donate. Uh, that uh, companies, those are bigger donations. That is the result of work of the board. When we literally sit, uh, we, we, we take our phone, phones, we write emails, we talk to people we know or we may know, we reach out. So that is the hardest, not the hardest, but probably the major part of the, of the um, uh, raising money when we when we get on the phone call or on, on, on a meeting, Zoom meeting or a coffee meeting, and we get this bigger, bigger donations. Um, I will give you an example. I had a coffee once with the couple, our biggest, I would say our most um, loyal uh, donors. Since the start, they reached out. We met uh, for a coffee. Till today, every single month, we receive check for $10,000. They believed in us, they see what we do. So things like this. Then of course, uh, you, uh, you know very well, ah, we have a fundraiser concerts. We've done uh, three big fundraiser concerts. One of them went on the 30th of April, our first one, and uh, our first in the, uh, we had it wasn't that big one because we didn't have much space it was this is in uh, swanee georgia correct yeah uh -huh. so we had a hundred, around 100 people capa uh, capacity so um our first one then we had another one in so that was uh everything will be ukraine and correct. all everything literally was donated from the musicians to the facility to the volunteers so that I want to say every dollar raised literally went to the cause. 100%, 100%. Yes. Um, I, of course, and I would like to say uh, the event venue, Bravo, where the, it happened, premises were, uh, the, the, it was free of charge, uh, musicians, um, uh, the oh even the the pastries we had from um, uh, yes. Natalia Natalia uh, I'm sorry I can't remember her name because I, everyone I'm deserves the credit to, I'm going to ask you not to to thank people individually because I know we could do that for about ten thousand exactly. hours exactly exactly there are so many volunteers that have been uh, working with you side by side by side by side thank so, you for that because if yeah. I if I miss someone it will not be nice. <laughs> Uh, right. So everything and every single dollar, um, unfortunately, don't remember how much we collected. Uh, so I want to think, say it was at least ten thousand dollars. And it, it, it was definitely like that. Very oh, quickly, correct. Correct. In, in, a, in a relatively small venue. So uh, even beyond uh, ticket sales for the event, uh, merchandise and whatever else was uh, contributed. Correct. Yes. Then we had another event in in Buckhead here in Blue Martini where we were sell we were had where we had auction of, uh, of beautiful paintings of uh, Katerina Ivonina. Uh, she presented those paintings for for the charity and we sold several paintings and we collected that event uh, gave us 
uh, brought us around six thousand dollars, I believe, maybe four, maybe six. I I I, I do believe maybe six thousand dollars. And then uh, we had, of course, our Independence Day. That was uh, Independence Day was the combination of um, um, charity, and of course, we had some. Since we had band, we had some other obligations to cover. Um, so that's not. It wasn't. A cheap and easy way, but it, so this would be an, an, a typical annual celebration of the U Ukrainian Independence a, Day, where now the focus actually changed to to bringing the community together and raising correct, funds. Correct. Yes. Correct. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, and in uh, in that uh, that event was brought around ten thousand uh, dollars again after uh, ten thousand dollars. I would say. Uh, receipts from from the from Independence Day concert, concert because you will see that I'm slowly coming to the uh, festivals and the merchandise uh, selling. So that is absolutely different bucket that brought around. Uh, I believe Olga just uh, reported around fifty seven thousand dollars. Right. So that's like a separate bucket that very very valuable because along with the raising money, uh, people also promote culture and traditions. So it's a great combination of our mission and goal. But let's take one particular one that comes to mind and break it down. Uh, do you have one one of the uh, events that you're thinking about? Um, maybe an international food market. Is there is there one of the events that uh, that comes to mind? Oh, uh, first the festival. I will uh, probably the very first one. That was uh, the one that I managed from the beginning till the end. Uh, so in Suwani was the night market, international night market in Suwani was the very first one in April. Okay, so awesome. So uh, Ukrainian Congress Committee of America, Georgia branch, attends, has a 10 by 10 booth, I wanna say, space at the, help me out again, Suwani, night market international night market international uh -huh. night market and what what was the purpose of being there i heard fundraising but w what were the other reasons that it was important for uh the community to be there to we needed for for population of that community where we were of america of georgia felt we need them to feel presence of ukrainians in their community. It, it is on such a, um, it, right, we all know there are Ukrainians in America, but showing up in all different festivals, it's physically showing presence of Ukrainians in each community, county. So people can feel that it's closer to them than they think. Because when you talk about this, it seems it's somewhere. But when you see these Ukrainians, beautiful Ukrainians with this beautiful uh, outfits that try to raise money to help with, with that you can actually talk and hear their story, that brings the presence of our in American community. That's how I feel it. And, and, and why, why is it, why was it at that event important for people who perhaps have never met a Ukrainian person, why was that important for them to, to, to talk to a Ukrainian person at, at the event? What happened? Excellent question. Um, because we are Ukrainians and we are different nationality from Russian. We are Ukrainians. We are not Russian. We, not because, you know, it's been very long history, it's just all this time we had to, sh for, for all this time of confusion, when people would always mix our culture with Russian culture, we had to put a big fat dot <laughs> in that period. We are Ukrainians. And the events in, in, in the world, in Ukraine, it's a proof. So we had to show our culture and traditions and make very, very clear, this is Ukrainian culture. And do you, do you have any stories to recount about people that you met who perhaps were meeting with a Ukrainian for the first time? 
Uh, not me. Mm -mm. Not me. I mean, for sure, people were going by and they were all very uh, uh, happy to see the colors. They were all very impressed. Mm. And I'm sure there were people that saw Ukrainians for the first time. I'm sure most of them saw this culture for the first time because it was very colorful. Yeah, I, I, I know that when I attended some of the events, my impressions were a lot of people really just wanted to be able to say, I'm so upset about what's happening in Ukraine and I feel for you and your family and how is your family? And there, there was a connections being made where people wanted to share their outrage of what was happening. And this was that opportunity to do so. And, and then I, there was always a glass container and there was money being dropped in quite frequently and quickly. And then there was all the crafts and merchandise and artwork that was for sale. So it seemed like there were a number of touch points of, of, of fundraising, engaging with the community, uh, uh, being able to share the story and, and perhaps even for uh, media purposes, being able to provide a place for, because I've noticed, I think there's been some media interviews that have actually taken place at these events where uh, UCCA Georgia branch has a, has, has, has a booth. Right, right, 100%. Uh, uh, delivering the message is one of the most important things that we need to do, right? Um, it's uh, talking about war and raising money for war actually brings a lot of attention because it, 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 for every probably person, it's something visual to see the things versus hearing them. And if they see this uh, people trying so hard, so maybe this, th this people know something that I don't know. Let me, let me ask, let me be curious a little bit more. And, and do you recall uh, in the past seven months, maybe how many festivals or fairs or art events that, uh, that you all have participated in? I, uh, I, but personally, uh, I uh, stopped participating, me personally, right? Because I, um, how to say, I was very busy with documentation because we talk about $400,000 spent and um, that time, that time flew so fast that I, I had to take care of that part. Um, but it probably <laughs> not less than 10, not less. Yeah. It's been a, a number of fairs. If you add the concerts, uh, there's been a lot of rallies, which I think. Rallies. Uh, yes. Um, very, very powerful tool. Um, but unfortunately people wouldn't support that much anymore. So uh, uh, I, I noticed you mentioned that you kind of kind of dr dropped off because of some back end things. I, I want to refer to my phone for a second. Let me turn it back on so I can get to a specific item. Um, this was a post, and I'm going to ask you about where the money went that's been sure. raised. I'm going to ask mm -hmm. you that in a second. But before I do that, uh, this was a post in the Ukrainian community of Atlanta, a public Facebook group, about 4,000 members, uh, yet another organization in Atlanta. But the a, uh, uh, Tetiana Lendel, mm -hmm. am I pronouncing that right? Lendier. Mm -hmm. Lendier, uh, who is a, also a UCCA Georgia branch board member, she's a treasurer, uh, she posted earlier today, knowing that you were going to be on the show, she says, uh, and I'm going to ask you for your reaction, Natalia is a true locomotive. She makes the impossible possible and does all the back office job that stays invisible to many. She takes the time from her own life to get a lot of processes set up and only under her leadership and professionalism, like no other, it could be done you not only need to want to do something, but you need to know how to do it. And she has both. Under her leadership, UCCA Georgia branch got set up and increased its footprint in Atlanta and in Georgia. I hope she will mention a lot of projects that UCCA did this year that were not public and all the efforts that UCCA has funded 
so local grassroots efforts could materialize. Do you want to comment on her comment? Uh, very, very nice uh, words. Um, <laughs> it's kind of a, really, a, a two-part really, thing. I, She's very, she, I, I think she kind of explained why, why you're not necessarily at each of those booths selling art because there's a, there's a lot that they, needs to be done behind the scenes. But I and 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 uh, obviously speaks glowingly of you and your effort. And I think the the, the board of directors uh, recognized you at the uh, 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 annual Independence Day concert on on stage for all your effort and energy. And much of it is actually behind the scenes. Um, but Tatiana did ask uh, um, uh, Tatiana. She mm -hmm. did mention that there's a number of things that may not have been promoted that UCCA has done. I, I think perhaps you've mentioned one of those is, is having coffee with a donor who's now contributed $10,000 every month uh, since uh, Russia uh, uh, right, invaded right. Ukraine. Are, are there other behind the scenes things that, that come to mind to talk about? Well, definitely constant meetings and um, negotiating as I mentioned, a Democratic Party reached out to us. We had a meeting. Um, they they had some ideas in mind. Um, well, you know, I would say I will actually probably say something back about Tatiana. Tatiana, uh, as a board member, right? She 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 also is a, a lawyer, and you can imagine what she would what she did behind the scenes. Um, people were calling her left and right. And very often she sacrificed her child, her family time to catch up on her work, right? We all have jobs and answering people because those are real people with real problems that need legal advice. So behind the scenes, each of us does a lot uh, probably by communicating, directing people. A lot of uh, questions come in our way that we have to direct and, and um, resolve. Um, Let's talk about money. You raised a lot of money. What was the purpose of raising the money? Where did it go? Right, and that's that's where our goal shifted several times. Uh, we were we thought that you know war didn't start on. Uh, 24th of February. We have had, uh, the war have been uh, going on since uh, 2014, right? Like we had the Eastern part of Ukraine after the revolution, uh, Putin didn't stop that, that we won Maidan and we had re-election of the president. He still, uh, he attacked uh, south, um, east of Ukraine. And uh, during this eight years of uh, this war on Eastern part of Ukraine, there were multiple funds uh, already acting on the, uh, in Ukraine that we could trust that were transparent. So our main goal was to collect money and, and send that money to these funds and let them do the job. Uh, as the war progressed, there was a period of time when there was huge deficit in everything. And when people were drafted left and right and government uh, from some reason, you know, it's we, we were not ready for that. I mean, we, we knew it would come, but not that, not on that day. Um, so people wouldn't have even like common things like uniforms. And having our board, one of, one of our directors on the ground, we delegated him to be our representative in Ukraine. And he started to, um, organize those shipments and uh, find vendors to provide uh, uniform or shoes, um, some equipment, uh, some gloves or knee. Uh, so, all, like, you know, all these things that seem for us like, you know, nothing special, however, because it seems like maybe they should have it from government. However, those drafted uh, men didn't have those basic things or maybe not that good quality so that was our next uh period of uh, donations when we actually started logistically co uh, deliver those supplies 
to refugees if that is um, that were some medications or mostly military people uh, because you know I actually during this time I have to mention I learned a lot about uh, military uh, tactics and one of uh, the military men and I don't know the name of their ranks in English but some very well respected man he told me before you save your brother on a battlefield, you need to actually defeat the enemy. So, so that was something that I took for myself, right? Um, if, if we don't defeat the enemy, we can't really help other people. So my personal, per, my personal view was that I really supported that uh, uniform or that tactical equipment and all the, and, and, and they all called them their eyes those monoculars that they could see at night. So I personally, in deep in my heart, I supported that way because we were, we knew that we were given this uh, equipment, this uniform, and if they were given to 10 people, we knew exactly what 10 people. Um, of course, that became very, very difficult. I remember I would call to Czech Republic. I would find those, or to buy those monoculars. It's not like, you know, there is like, manual hey here you go do this you have to think here where do i get monoculars google you know and then you call these people then then you try to find delivery you, then you try to find people in europe that would actually pick up then you try to find a way to actually get it in the in ukraine through the border it's it's this logistics it's very very exhausting so that is what go, go ahead you, you had a question well, i i want to say i recall there were uh walkie talkies that that were is that is that the right term Correct. uh-huh uh-huh Motoro, well yeah walkie talkies yeah that's the right way to say uh I, there may have been uh uh military grade first aid kits i believe correct yes um those were our uh, one of those projects where uh, the big the one the biggest one was medical equipment that project cost us more than thirty thousand dollars maybe thirty five thousand dollars we bought from poland uh we bought around uh four so they are expensive because one of uh, that it's vacuum uh that uh, helps to heal the wounds and this one equipment, um, so we bought like four equipments, but, but the, uh, the, the, the components to actually, that has to be changed every single time for each patient, for each, those were uh, the, the hardest to get and, and the, they were costly because we, can't, we couldn't just give the equipment. We have to provide the entire kit so that could save lives. Uh, so that was a big project and very, very, a little bit stressful because we had to organize all the shipment from, from Poland. And then in Lviv, a uh, volunteer of ours, uh, because it's kind of like now it's like a net. We all know each other and we all ask for favor if we need to. And she helped to actually distribute everything in Ukraine to different hospitals. One went to Lviv hospital, one went to one went to cave, two went to cave, and one went to actually east uh, to the, like I would say, to the front line. Uh, and we know exactly where they are. We have acts of uh, goods received. Uh, we know exactly where they are. Um, then we had, of course, medical kits, the first medical aid kits. Um, amazing with the help of uh, other members of community, we found the, that factory that actually is in Ternopil, in my town. They organized, they changed the entire workshop that used to be, they, they used to produce bags, like good quality bags. And that good quality bags, like uh, they, they, you know, like they had this fabric. So that was perfect for first kids because that had to be good fabric. So, and, and they actually started to do that massive production. However, it was, you know, because people, it, another problem that was a lot of fraud was started to happen. And even that factory, they were very much uh, careful who do they work with. 
because I can take that kid, can buy it for, for, for X amount of money, like for $50, for $50 that was the money, the, the price we bought. And on the market, I go and I sell it for $100 because that's the market price. You know, they had to be careful. Um, so it, in terms of uh, the, the, the monies in, monies out, uh, uh, w- will there be a report on uh, uh, ukrainianatlanta.org so that people can actually see all the monies raised and where it went? I will tell you even more that all the time, the back office job I have been doing um, I'm an accountant. I'm I I am a CPA. So that's something that I I do on in, in my life. I'm good with numbers. Um, so all that activity requires a full time job accountant, and uh, we just don't get paid. Just just don't get paid. And yeah, we, I, I should point out you're you're all volunteers that are hundred percent. A in, yes, Georgia branch, and you all have day jobs, real day jobs, and are volunteering. So uh, this is not something that you get paid for. Uh, and I imagine as a 501c3, you need to do a lot of reporting back to the uh, IRS anyway. So all, all the records of where the monies went uh, shows up someplace, either on the website or in the, the government report or both. Correct. Yeah. Um, correct. And, you know, we never dealt with that volume of uh, data uh, that required purchase of uh, accounting system and actually maintaining that system. And time flies so fast that at one moment when you realize it's $300,000 spent, um, things has to be done in a different way. I, I want to move on to a different topic, but I just want to put a bow on it and just ask one, one more question, because uh I understand the fundraising at, at the very beginning. Uh, today, though, the uh, the U.S. Congress uh, a- approved the appropriation for something like forty billion dollars uh, just today. Representative, uh, the highest ranking official to date to go to Kiev today, literally uh, announced. I want to say three billion dollar plus uh, going to Kiev. I think. As of today, 13.5 billion of the 40 billion has actually been allocated, uh, distributed to Ukraine. Is does fundraising continue to be something important at the grassroots level? And if so, why is that? It's a it's a, it's a question that I actually uh, ask myself many times, and each of us, because when when we see all this uh, help coming that that all all, co- all governments promise we still get this request. So I don't think I have an answer why, but yes, the, it's an ongoing goal. And there are always uh, military divisions that need our help always. Uh, plus, as uh, I, I, I need to explain, that was I explained, there are very regular, there are regular basic um, expense um, buckets mm-hmm. in, in military, in Ukraine, in military of Ukraine, and some things that they call luxury are not predicted, are not budgeted. So, for example, the monoculars, the night vision devices, it's it's a luxury in in that in this case. Uh, drone, it's a luxury. Drone is three four thousand uh, dollars. Cars, the turnover of cars is crazy, right? So things that are not predicted by the government that are not budgeted. That's what we usually get a request for. Uh, generator, just now, just several days ago, we bought, we bought, we sent money to the fund that bought the generator to Kharkiv, some Kharkiv uh, division. Uh, so th- there are things that uh, I would explain are like luxury, and that's why we we are in help or or some very good quality walkie talkies. They need exact motorolas that are that are difficult that are you can't actually listen to that will work on a long distance that will keep the battery so things like this we always always so st- still a need and if uh, in, any of our viewers want to make a contribution they can go to ukrainianatlanta.org uh, and uh, feel confident in that the, the uh, UCCA Georgia branch is a 501c nonprofit has to do all the reporting back to the IRS. And then you can take care of distributing either funds to other organizations in 
Ukraine or actual specific items and figure out the logistics of actually getting the items to the right places? Well, logistics, that's the key word, because we don't, we just collect money and we send them to the, uh, to foundations in Ukraine that buy, uh, that know how to get things and they deliver and they, but, but we definitely send them to funds we trust. How do they trust them? Because they would be referred by uh, community members. As the community fundraiser, we work for community. So yeah. when the request comes from the community member, that request will have that community member name. So okay. that, yeah, so that's how we know. And then I face to face, I talk to this fund and I know exactly how things are done in Ukraine. It's a very much a restricted, directed help. However, we send it to the organization in Ukraine and that organization like delivers help too. Awesome, uh, to just switch topics a little bit. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at the Sunday New York Times Magazine. Uh, um, this this is a multi-page story about the um, the in Mariupol the drama the uh, I want to say Donetsk regional academic drama theater that was bombed by Russia uh, hundreds of people killed this was. Uh, going back to the earlier days, um, Mario Paul, uh, I, I think another newspaper article from the New York Times today, I think literally says 90% of residential buildings were damaged or destroyed in, in the battle for the city, according to the United Nations, uh, United Nations uh, as reported in today's New York Times these horrific things that are ha have happened are happening. That said, the New York Times Sunday Magazine says, as Russia's war on Ukraine enters its seventh month, the world's interest, is, interest in it inevitably diminishes. Um, in another article in the Wall Street, in the New York Times just today, only in a poll of Americans, only 22% of respondents in the United States list Ukraine as a top three global issue. What is it that the UCCA Georgia branch is doing to help amplify the story so that it doesn't end up on the back page of the newspaper of dropped off the TV news? Well, you see, see hey, um, well, first of all, of course, mass media is our our best tool uh, when we can share when we can, when we don't forget our main holidays. I would say from what UCCA have done, it's first of all, it's Independence Day. It was a huge event for us because it was a very um, big event and the organizational part of the preparation was very much uh, involving. Um, so that was something that I would say was a huge success because we collected around almost 400 people. And that means that we already attracted enough attention of people that 400 people showed up to, for Independence Day. And a lot of them were not Ukrainians, were foreigners. Of course, um, I, I probably think that, well, we try to, what we also do, uh, maybe you already saw on Facebook, we are, we are trying to open this, uh, start this cultural center where we would uh, promote even more culture and we would uh, talk to people to see, hear their feedback um, about what are the needs. So let's um, talk more about that. That's uh, 10 a.m. Saturday, September 10th, 2022. That's this Saturday, Ukrainian Cultural and Education Center. W what is that? What is what's open? Excuse me. I thought I I turned it off. <laughs> okay. If certainly if it's family uh, from Ukraine, we can pause. No, no, no. It's um, I am so sorry. I I sure I was positive. I turned it off. Okay. So uh, 10 a.m. Saturday, September 10th, 2022. That's this Saturday the Ukrainian Culture and Education Center opens. What is that? Why is that important? 
thank you for this question, uh, because this is something that uh, was on our mind for a very long time. And um, there is a, there is a story behind this. Uh, we actually it, it it's been in our plans for a very long time, and we just you know we were always busy with different things. And of course, war happened, so we were mostly concentrated on war and and uh, fundraising and uh, satisfying requests, helping Ukraine. However. Um, you know, everything has a reason that happens to us in our life. Uh, the Ukrainian school in Georgia that been operating for several years under Natalia Homenko supervision uh, asked us um, in April to help them to find premises for their school. So, um, what we uh, we of course we try to help and it's not that easy to find premises because we're talking about children we're talking about education that has to be um well equipped uh, premises because there are a lot of standards um and of course we don't have much resources to to pay so we were trying to uh, find a good deal in a good uh, place um, so same to Jana Landier, she, she is an alumni of Amory, and she actually was able to get those five beautiful classes in Amory, well equipped, free of charge. Um, so we had that, that classes and we already signed the agreement with organization UCCA Georgia and Amory. Um, during this process, Natalia Homenko, uh, 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 refused, uh, she rejected, she rejected this um, premises. I mean, not rejected, I would say she said the location is not uh, good for her, for, for the for the for children. So they uh, found another uh, other premises somewhere in Alpharetta, because that's where most of her uh, parents of her students are. Um, and which is okay, if that's the preference of, uh, of children, of their families. But we felt like this is not the right decision just to cancel agreement and lose this opportunity of having these five beautiful classes well equipped, given to us. This is this is miracle. So we decided to keep that those premises. And uh, for those parents that maybe didn't have from some reason um, voice on this decision to relocate school or for parents that uh, for people families that are located in the area that uh, that for them Amory will be more comfortable we are step this cultural um, educational um, program I would say to serve the community and we will serve them with what they what they are in need so that's the purpose of the meeting in 10 a, uh, uh, at 10 a.m on saturday we go in we want to collect all the families that are interested in that location in that premises that um maybe see that as a prestige way of introducing their children to a different standard because we all know emory is amazing school and uh, having the opportunity to go to that school once once a week and just be in those walls and absorb the energy and maybe set yourself for a bigger success in future. That's the beginning of something big for us. So this is both for children and for adults. Is, well, yes, it will be some immersion in everything Ukraine. Correct. So that will <clears> be the purpose of the meeting. Uh, we need to understand uh, the needs of community. Maybe there are adults that would like to get together and, and uh, you know, do the embroidery uh, and someone could teach them embroidery. Maybe someone could teach them how to knit or how to could, make could their own. In? This yeah. is embroidered, right? That can yeah. be made by, by people. Yes. By us. So this is part of a traditional Ukrainian outfit that you're wearing. I am, yes. This is Ukrainian outfit. This is handmade embroidery. And of course, we try to make, you know, this cultural center. We can say it's a, it's a school. It's not a competition to the existing school in yes. Alpharetta. It's an alternative yes. for those for something different or for children that is better location uh, uh, would be in the city in Amory. 
Yes, it, Atlanta, the greater Atlanta area is very large. So for, for anyone that's outside of Atlanta, it's not necessarily a, a, a short drive to go from Alpharetta to a, Atlanta. Correct. Um, <clears throat> I, I did have just a couple other questions is, um, uh, we'll speak a little bit about my community first. Uh, we get around network forum community is uh, 20,000 plus real estate photographers in 150 countries. Um, specifically, what is it that photographers, videographers can do that are watching today's show? What's, what's the call to action to them wherever they live of how they can help? Excellent question. Uh, nowadays, we live in the virtual world. And literally, <laughs> we even, uh, so we can uh, in online world. So that's the beautiful way uh, to, not beautiful, efficient way to deliver the message and deliver that to everyone in the world. Like, I'm really, really grateful for this opportunity talking to you today because um, this is video, right? It can be distributed in all different ways everywhere in the world. Uh, and they can, find out that there is this fundraiser they can trust maybe, you know, or, or they want to come visit our one of our events. <laughs> um, also, I will give you the exact example. Uh, one of the uh, military divisions we held in Ukraine, they actually had a photographer um, uh, in the hot spot in, in the front line, making videos, making pictures and making a story on their division, on their battles in order to engage people to donate and help them. So that was a huge and powerful tool because people were, first of all, the photographer is uh, famous, right? As you are, it was a big honor of us that when you show our pictures means that you endorse us. Every kind of um, uh, photographers, especially those that are known and they, they are already been doing something in, in their career. If they show something, if they endorse something, it brings attention to people because you are professional, well-respected professional. You will think twice before you post something. It's your work, right? And if you decide to post us, it means for other people that looking at your at your work, that it worth attention. So it's a I, huge, huge um, way of delivering information. I, I think in, in, in my case, I, I didn't wait for anybody to ask. I just like, you know, I feel horrible about what's going on over there. What is it I can do? I'm a photographer. Okay, there's a, a rally downtown Atlanta. There's a, a festival in Swanee. There's a concert uh, up in Swanee. There's an event happening in Alpharetta. I just show up and I take photos and I take video. And I, I would say, you know, looking back on the content that I've created, it really is probably done, you know, four things that I think about. First is trying to help amplify the story uh, in a digital world. So if those photos and videos get posted uh, in, uh, let's say, the Ukrainian community of Atlanta, a public Facebook group, and those pictures get shared. So first is amplifying the story. The second, which I really didn't realize, but just happened, was um, many of the Ukrainian Americans have plenty of family that are in Ukraine, and they're sharing those Facebook posts with their family, with their friends, and, and now people in Ukraine are responding to those posts saying thank you for all that all the Ukrainians are doing in the greater Atlanta area. To help us, we appreciate it. Uh, I think the third thing is uh, when I take in a, pictures at a at a let's say an art festival, and then there's another art festival coming up. Uh, that coming up event needs art. It needs a, a photo to tell the story, and so photos from one event get repurposed to tell the story for the the next event. Uh, is an illustration. And, and, and I think one of the other things, I know we weren't going to talk about individual people because there'd be a million people to thank, um, but you know there is a member of the community, Olga Gorman. Olga, uh, every time is at every event, and every time she's at an event, 
she has noted every volunteer that has showed up. And then she typically takes the photos and videos that I have shot of that event or another photographer, another volunteer photographer that has shown up and, uh, and literally thanks everybody. Every, every, every one of the volunteers who has contributed artwork mm -hmm. or food or crafts, everyone who has volunteered to, to work that booth, anyone who's been involved in helping amplify the message on social media. And she thanks people. And I think it's just great that the photos and video get used to thank people to just let them know their 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 volunteer time is is much appreciated. 100%. That that job cannot be underestimated uh, to actually follow up and thank everyone. So I, I think as f photographers, it's super easy. Find an event that's going on in your community, wherever that is in the world, and go document it and then go offer your photos and videos at no charge to the organizer of the event. And then just keep repeating that and just keep repeating that and repeating that. And you'll you'll make a difference of something that you just take for granted that that's your skill set to do, but it it, it has such value to uh, to the Ukrainian community around the globe. Um, knowing that this show that's presently airing live in the Ukrainian community of Atlanta Facebook group will likely be shared with family and friends that are in Ukraine. What message would you like to share with Ukrainians? And I'm going to ask you, to, if you don't mind, to say that in Ukraine and speak to your family, your friends, and the and all the Ukrainian people. What message would you like to tell them? Uh, in Ukrainian, right? Yes. Дорогі, дорогі мої українці. Ми в Америці дуже за вас всіх переживаємо. I can't, you know what, I will be start, I will start crying, so I will try to, <laughs> um, because. Uh, it's important. They want, they want to hear from a board member and president of the Ukrainian Congress Committee of America, Georgia branch, of what, it, what message you would like to send to them in their language. Дорогі українці. Ми діаспора за кордоном не лишаємося осторонь. Нам набагато нам дуже важко спостерігати за подіями, тому що ми далеко від дому. Ми слідкуємо за новинами, і наше серце розривається. Ми слідкуємо за життям наших рідних і близьких, які залишились в Україні. І Ще важче від того, що ми не знаємо і не можемо допомогти, але ми робимо все можливе. Ми збираємо гроші, ми висилаємо допомогу, як можемо. Ми працюємо, ми працюємо на перемогу, ми прославляємо Україну, ми йдемо по, Амери... ми, ми йдемо по американській землі з гордо піднятою головою, як українці. Ми представляємо себе як нація, яка вміє боротися, яка обов'язково переможе. Ми достойно себе несемо в цій країні, щоб кожна людина, яка зустрілася з кожним з нас, де б то не було в світі, залишилася лише з найкращими почуттями, відчуттями про зустріч з українцем. Це відчуття, ми повинні, повинні жити з тим. Усі українці світу, ми повинні гордо нести себе, уміти гарно розмовляти, з повагою відноситися до усього і усіх оточуючих, щоб про нас знали і думали е, з захватом, яка ми прекрасна нація, які прекрасні люди в Україні. Слава Україні! I'm Ukrainian American and I have no idea what you said. Could you share that with us in English? What I said that uh, Ukrainians in, uh, in America, in all over the world, they don't stay aside. We try to do what we can. It breaks our heart. It breaks our heart that we can't help physically. Um, it's uh, being away outside of the situation 
makes it so difficult because we can't, um, it's also difficult, I would say, right? That we can't really, we can just watch, we can't do much. However, we found our way of helping, we raise money because physically we can't do anything. So if we can donate, we donate money and people that do the hard work could deliver uh, necessary, ne necessary supplies in Ukraine. Also, what I said that as, as Ukrainians, we have to carry ourselves with respect and total uh, love to our surrounding because every person we meet on our way, way has to leave, has to, uh, has, has to um, leave meeting with us with the feeling of happiness and um, honor of meeting a Ukrainian. We need to present ourselves and think before we do something or say something because we don't represent ourselves. It's not I anymore. We represent entire Ukraine and we need to make sure that our surrounding knows us at our best side. Natalia, thank you for being a guest on the show today. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity, Dan. Uh, really, really, you, you, you had excellent questions and I feel very sensitive right now because you dig into some memories, but thank you for that. We've been visiting with Natalia Anapskiv. Excellent. Board member and president, Ukraine excuse me, Ukrainian Congress Committee of America, Georgia branch. I'm Dan Smigrod, founder of the We Get Around Network Forum, and you've been watching WGAN-TV live at five. Glory to Ukraine. Glory to the heroes. <laughs>